thank you to the, to the seminar and thank you to Shruti for uh, setting this up. Um, it's a bit of a challenge trying to make a presentation about a book that most of you have not actually held in your hands and it is a photo book. Um, by which I mean it's not simply a book of uh, pictures and text, it's not a coffee table book. It's, a, it's a, a photo book which has a certain physical shape and form and affect for that reason. Uh, but we'll try and uh, work around that. Um, what this book is, um, is it comes out of uh, a, a long engagement uh, on my part, which is at least for the last 12, 13 years. I have, as Vaseem mentioned, uh, been trying to engage uh, in different ways with Kashmir and to try and communicate some of what I think happens there, um, both to my, I mean, to understand it for myself and to share it with the larger world. Uh, it began with a film, a feature length film that I made uh, between 2004 and 2007 called Jashne Azadi. And it's in the course of making that film that I encountered a strange problem, which was that it was extremely difficult to get Kashmiris to tell me what had happened in the 1990s. Um, everybody agreed that it was a dark and terrible time, but um, there were no words that could fill that space. Sometimes there would be a hint of it in a kind of conversation, but if I came back with the camera, then those words would dry up. You know, It was as if sim people simply didn't have a language with which to address what was, what was a deeply traumatic period. And I don't want to over-summarize it, but in a nutshell, in 1990, there was a, 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 a culmination of a long period of dissatisfaction uh, with, let's say, call it Indian rule. And uh, it very quickly escalated into an armed rebellion. And uh, even quicker, uh, it, it was at the receiving end of a very, very brutal counterinsurgency kind of uh, move on the part of the Indian state. And it really tore uh, Kashmir and Kashmiris apart. Uh, and so the 90s are uh, often thought of as this kind of dark phase uh, for most people. So it was in trying to find a means of evoking what had happened in the 90s that I started looking at the work of photographers. And, uh, and I was very struck by uh, the richness of what photojournalists held. And um, given that, uh, you know, how we, how we encounter photojournalistic images, we see them at an image at a time, they might be a striking image, you're struck by something, you say, what a great picture, and then you move on, and then maybe three months later, you see another great picture. So it kind of disappears, you know. Uh, but it's when I sat with the work of one photographer, for example, and looked at the work of a decade, the enormity of what some of these people were had documented was very, very striking. Eventually, for various reasons, I actually managed to lay my hands on very, very valuable archival video. So I didn't use the still material uh, for the film. But somewhere in the back of my mind, uh, I always knew that something was going on. You know that, and, and I was, and that it wasn't simply that in the 90s there were some extraordinary photographers, but that it had somehow developed into a kind of tradition. You know. um, what do I mean by that? The, the time period that I looked at is 1986-2016, which is a 30-year period. Uh, it is the period of enormous upheaval in Kashmir. It's also a period in which Kashmiris, for the first time, made themselves heard and understood uh, in fairly unambiguous ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, you know, if you want to really summarize it, well, the short answer was, Hum kya chahte you know, what do we want? Freedom. And the answer to that, uh, you know, if you want to put substance to it, you, it's a complicated answer. But at the very simplest, this was it. So, um, about a year and a half ago, out of the blue, somebody wrote to me and said, would you like to 
come up with an idea for a collaborative project in the arts in Kashmir. And somewhere from the back of my mind, I said, this is what I would really like to do. And the book that is here is eventually uh, that old idea now kind of uh, made into a book. So it's a 30-year time period, and it's the work of nine photographers. The oldest is my age, which is therefore very old. The youngest is uh, 19. Um, so it's a range of uh, people, backgrounds, training, education, social location, a real kind of mix. And of course, to make it clear that it's not, I, I don't think that these are the nine only the nine great photographers there are. I think there are, I could find at least another 20 such photographers whose work actually merits inclusion, but it's a, it's already a fat 400 page book and I had to draw the line somewhere. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to very quickly uh, run you through uh, just four or five images from each of the nine photographers. It also will give us uh, something, because as I said, you haven't seen the book, it will give you something to get your hooks onto, so if somebody would dim the lights, then... So the, the, the form of the book is really uh, uh, sort of... Uh, the, the, the book is arranged chronologically, which is to say by, by age, um, um, from the oldest to the youngest, and each uh, chapter, which consists of 20-25 images, is followed by a text. The text is, uh, we call it a profile, but it really comes out, there's something that I have written, which is really comes out of a conversation that, or oh, many conversations that I had with the photographers in the course of the last year and a half. So, um, yeah, so I'll just begin. It's witness, Kashmir, 1986-2016, and nine photographers, like I said. So the first of them is Mirajuddin. He's really the sort of doyen of uh, photojournalism in Kashmir. Um, again, unschooled, um, fell into photography as often happens with people. Um, this uh, very iconic image of a crackdown in downtown Srinagar. Uh, and if there's time, I'll tell you a little bit about this image because I revisited the site of this picture with him. And there's quite a story in how we found almost everybody in this frame except for the old lady who died. This very important image, the assassination of Justice Neil Ganju, uh, probably the first of a series of political assassinations that uh, sort of started the, the dark years in Kashmir. Justice Neil Ganju was also the man who had given the death sentence to Makul Bhatt, who was the founder of the Jammu Kashmir Liberation Front. And so his assassination was seen as a kind of retribution for a death sentence that was believed to have been unfairly passed. This from an election campaign in 1992, uh, an election boycott actually. Um, the coffin placed in the town square of uh, the town of Anantanag and uh, scribbled on its lid, it says, you know, this gari, this vehicle, is, uh, can be taken by whoever has the guts to vote, basically. So it was a kind of threat that if you vote, well, this is what you're going to get. Um, as you can see, the, the negative is quite badly damaged, and uh, this war is part of the consequence of the 2014 flood, when many of the photographers had their, whatever rudimentary archives that they had, went into the flood. And um, this included digital hard disks, it included negatives, and we did restore some of the images of, that Merajadin had on negative, but we chose not to clean up all of them in a sort of artificial way or partially to retain the kind of texture of what had happened. Uh, this uh, image uh, in the aftermath of the siege of Chirari Sharif, Chirari Sharif was very, very important was and is a very, very revered Sufi shrine, possibly the most revered Sufi shrine in Kashmir. And in uh, 1992, it was a site of a standoff between uh, sort of a, quite a celebrated and notorious militant commander called Maskhi and uh, the Indian army, and it ended with uh, the complete destruction of the, the shrine. 
uh, this image from the uh, in the aftermath of the Bijbihara massacre, where 52 people were killed. Uh, obviously, photographers didn't get there till after the bodies had been removed. But what you do see are the slippers. Uh, but you also see the light leak on the left side of the frame, which is what happened when uh, Merajuddin's camera was snatched and the soldiers removed the roll of film. Uh, and uh, just oh, a frame and a half survived. And uh, interestingly, we were able to actually scan the two existing frames. So there's a kind of unfinished story which, uh, which stays in these exposed frames. I'll just read you a little bit of text. I began to carry two identity cards in two different pockets, one in my shirt and another in my pants. In case something happened, I wanted people to know who they had found. Every day was full of such sights. At one grenade blast, I saw an elderly man rushing around helping to pick up victims tirelessly until he turned over this one body and realized it was his own son. All of us photographers wept that day. The second photographer is Javed Shah. He was for many years uh, the staff photographer of the Indian Express and um, a, a very um, unusual newspaper photographer uh, with a very distinct signature style and it remains a puzzle to me as to how someone who had this kind of an imagination could be a photojournalist and uh, I actually managed to meet the, the editor who we used to work with at the Indian Express. He was a young editor at that time, uh, Raj Kamal Jha, he's now the editor-in-chief of, of the Indian Express. And it was a very rare instance of a kind of synergy between a creative photographer uh, and a very open-minded uh, editor. And it kind of created the space in which Javed was able to uh, bring in a certain kind of more ambiguous uh, material into what is otherwise a very highly circumscribed field. You know, photojournalism doesn't give you too much space. Uh, sorry, this image is of a young uh, Fidaeen uh, after an attack in uh, downtown uh, Srinagar. And this is in the aftermath of an avalanche in a village called Waltengu. Uh, so, these pictures? so this would be, this is uh, 2002, I think. This yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, like everybody else here, this is Javed Shah. I have several birthdays. Call it intuition, telepathy, whatever, but I do believe in it. Because that's the only way you can survive this place. Why did I start shooting so many of those distorted reflections those days? Maybe it was to mirror the madness that had taken over our streets. An experiment of sorts or a sign of my frustration at what was going on. Who can say? The third is Dar Yasin. He's the photographer with the Associated Press. It's the kind of job where you go out every morning and you shoot a couple of pictures and you file them at the end of the day and he does see himself very much as a kind of foot soldier, you know, like I shoot because this is my job. But in that, you can see him uh, sort of trying to look for meaning uh, within what he's doing, very interested in form always in terms of what's going on within his pictures. This image in the aftermath of a clash between militants and security forces in which this house in the neighborhood had been looted by the soldiers. So the family has just walked into their home. Uh, and this more recent 2014 image of a funeral of a militant uh, commander uh, in the village of Pehlipura. I was shooting once near the HMT factory on the outskirts of Srinagar. It was a day-long encounter with militants and the army was keeping us from the gun battle. When it was over and all of us photographers rushed in, I got busy looking at the bodies, taking pictures, the usual. Suddenly I had a feeling that the place looked oddly familiar and stopped. When I looked around, I realized that the place I was standing in was the burnt out shell of my old school. I was so shaken, I must have stood there for several minutes, my ears ringing, unable to move. Javed Dar. Uh, Javed Dar, uh, I first met in 2004 uh, when he was the district photographer uh, of a small, very small Srinagar newspaper. He used to shoot with a little point and shoot click three, or not click three, whatever those digital cameras were called like that. 
and has since become the uh, photojournalist for the for Zenua, the Chinese news agency. And uh, this image of Asiya Andravi, who heads the Doctorani Millet, which is a sort of orthodox uh, women's um, uh, Muslim group, uh, Muslim women's group, uh, uh, very much pro Pakistan. This is from a press conference. Uh, this image from uh, a protest by government employees, the purple dye is, you know, what's used to color protesters so that they can't pretend they weren't there. A funeral, uh, I don't think this was not, this was not a sort of security versus militant thing. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I should have known what the exact context was with too many pictures. This, an image that I personally love. Um, Javid is from a little village, as I said, close to uh, Anantanag, and he goes home every weekend. And he sort of obsessively shoots the migrant labor who come to Kashmir every year. And this is something that most people don't even know that every year almost 250,000 migrant labor from India come and work as plumbers, masons, builders. Um, in this case, these Rajasthani migrants who come to make uh, brooms out of the, uh, you know, the, the stalk of the rice. And um, obviously this is not the kind of photograph that a, a, a news agency would be interested in. So part of what I was trying to do was to look at their collections to see what are the images that people take for their own pleasure and how can you, you know, create space. And this aftermath of a fire in Frisland, which is a, a very near the tourist town of Pehlgaon. I can remember the day the first crackdown happened in our village. I had just finished my metric exam. It was June 9, 1992. The army arrived early in the morning and they came in trucks. So we knew this was not going to be routine. We were meant to start planting paddy that day and had left the house early. The first day of planting was a sort of festival in Kashmir. We were stopped by the soldiers as we walked to the far end of the village and told to go back home. My father tried to argue, but they said no. Boys like him are the terrorists. I purposely stopped this and uh, this piece of text here, but in the book, it goes on to a completely horrific description of this 15-year-old being taken and waterboarding at a time when I think most of us hadn't heard of waterboarding. So just in case anybody thought that Guantanamo was where they invented waterboarding, well, you know, uh, Kashmir experience tells you quite a different story. Altaf Kadri. Um, Altaf Kadri used to be the photographer with the European Photo Press Agency and now works for the Associated Press in Delhi. I mentioned their institutional affiliations for an important reason because one of the, re one of the reasons why they have been able to do the work that they have been able to do is because they represented international agencies and I think that is something that has to be remembered. That uh, most of them would not have been able to survive the kind of uh, control that uh, photographers and journalists uh, routinely have to come under, uh, whether they work for Kashmir-based news media or they work for uh, New Delhi-based media. Uh, so this, uh, the aftermath of a grenade attack in uh, Lal Chok, Srinagar, uh, a shopkeeper beaten during a protest. Uh, this rather disturbing image of a policeman being carried in the aftermath of a grenade attack. I, but I show it because uh, the hand that you see up here, uh, that up there, there uh, is actually Altaf Kadri's hand. So he's both helping to carry away the injured policeman and taking the picture, which tells you something of the strange position in which Kashmiri photographers find themselves. Because I doubt if you would find a New Delhi based photographer or an international photographer uh, doing this. For, for that kind of person it would be crossing a line which you're not meant to cross. Whereas for the Kashmiri photographers who live and work amongst their own people, half of them or more than half of them are on one side of the divide and some might be policemen, but they are your own people. They could be your relatives, they could be your family, they could be your friends. This image a funeral of a militant commander and this, the funeral of three dead uh, militants. A man had been blown up while diffusing an improvised explosive device in Palhalan village. At least that's what the newspapers in Srinagar had reported. 
Later that morning, when we photographers got there, the people of the village were so angry, they were ready to lynch us. We ended up being chased through the village for almost 300 meters before a conversation could even be started. You only carry the army version, the furious young men said to us. Whatever they say matters, what we say never gets reported. It usually takes a, bit of pers a lot of persuasion by the buzul, the village elders, to restore the balance. Still, I always like to talk and never give up without arguing for what I believe in. Whether I end up getting slapped up or beaten, no issue, that's part of it. It's actually very interesting how in the text you'll find many of them talk about being beaten up and it's almost like a rite of passage. In fact, um, Shumit Deyal, who's the photographer you're going to encounter next, he describes um, an occasion when he got beaten up in a crowd because people thought that he was, he was spying for the, for the paramilitary forces. And when he met his friends, uh, expecting that there would be sympathy, they said, well, welcome to the club. And you've only been beaten up by the local population. Now you're only half a photographer, half a Kashmiri photographer. Now when the CRP have beat you up, that's when you'll be complete. You know? So it's, it's actually quite bizarre the kind of calm with which people will routinely talk about being beaten up because they see that there is so much anger, uh, you know, uh, amongst people that when photographers arrive often, they are the first signs of the outside world and there is so much anger against the outside world that getting slapped up is part of the deal and you just live with it, you know. Shumit. Shumit is a very, very interesting figure in the book. He, uh, although that's not central to his presence, he is the only non-Muslim photographer, which in the context of Kashmir does become uh, significant. Um, his family are from Rajori, uh, which is uh, not in the, in the valley itself, but in the hilly uh, region. But his parents grew up in Srinagar, they are Kashmiri speakers, you know, and so Kashmiri in every sense of the word. Shumit grew up in Nepal um, and is one of the few people here with a very sort of high-end education in photography. He went to the International Center for Photography in New York, made a very significant career for himself as a photojournalist. So in the kind of uh, pecking order of photojournalists, uh, Shumit has done three covers for Time magazine, which counts for a lot if you play that game. He's done the cover of Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India. He's done the cover of Sachin Tendulkar. He's done the cover for Amir Khan. So if you know what I mean, he's done the high-end, high-visibility stuff. But in 2009, he went back to Kashmir, leaving behind all his fancy lenses and, you know, all his sort of the high end of what he makes a living doing um, on a completely personal trip. I mean, he, he, I think he called it something like going home or something like that. He had a bag with five camera bodies, all cheap Russian bizarre cameras, a panoramic camera, uh, you know, a range of pretty sort of avant-garde camera bodies uh, linked only by one thing, which was that they all had 400 ASA black and white film. And he proceeded then to go to the very same spaces that all his colleagues there did go to, but made a, for a very different kind of, of imaging, um, portraits, and very interested in how he was going to show this work, very, very keen on controlling the way that his images would work. So uh, those of you who will recognize what these are, uh, you know, these are negative strips, you know, what, what were called contact sheets in the old days, except that these are not real contact sheets, they're, they're, they're made up of sections of different stories, so it's a kind of story that he's built up from many pictures, and he always shows this on a light table, which is a, a table which is lit from below with a loop, a loop is a magnifier, which so, so when you enter a room where this work is showing, you actually have to lean over and, and look at the pictures and it has a, I've seen it done like that, it's very, very dramatic because it gives you a certain kind of agency, you know there's a story, but you look at certain details, you move back and forth. So he's very interested in how you show the pictures, not in a flat two-dimensional way just as a, in a magazine. Uh, eventually he started looking at his own family pictures, 
making the argument that the world was saturated with images and was there any need to create more and why couldn't we look for meaning within pictures that exist. And then sometimes combining uh, family pictures with his own work, in this case uh, the image that you saw in the middle, which is the back of a postcard from his grandfather, which says, Wish you live long, best wishes, Bayal, and matting it with an image he had taken of a horse crossing a cemetery wall in winter in Srinagar. Uh, I'm not, uh, this is not in, uh, entirely in his voice, it's part of the text that I've written. I'm not done with my work in Kashmir, I'm not done with all that. When I go back, I'll do something that a large number of people will understand. I need to pull myself back from a level of abstraction and take the work to some other level, he said. In the tales of ghosts who want to be set free, what holds them back is memory, Sumit had written some years ago. There is a certain grip about my childhood memories from Kashmir and a past I must unfold to know who I am. It is here at home that I searched for the experience of being in a space where and here Shumit Deal cut himself short and turned to T.S. Eliot. We shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Shokat Nanda, uh, young, from the town of Baramulla in North Kashmir, um, quite remarkable, went to school in Baramulla, did his BA in Baramulla, um, lives in Baramulla, married there, has a child, went to the US for two years to study photojournalism at the University of Missouri, uh, but when came right back, um, still lives uh, in Baramulla and most of his pictures are taken within maybe 50 kilometers of, of home. And uh, I admire that kind of, uh, you know, because he's, he's actually, uh, he could make a place for himself anywhere, anywhere in the world almost, but he just chooses to stay on there. Um, this is an early picture of his, 2004 protest by women in Langit. This from a very important series that he did, which uh, we sort of loosely call Baramulla Boys. It was about uh, where he followed uh, a bunch of boys who were on the run from the police and he, uh, with, their, with their permission, uh, made portraits of them in various places where they hid. So it could be a cemetery as in this case or an abandoned hospital building uh, as is this one, a more journalistic uh, image. At some point during our conversation, we found ourselves stopping in the middle of Cement Bridge. On a December afternoon in 1989, it was the site of a massive public celebration, a spontaneous outburst after five Kashmiri militants were released from prison. The next day on the back foot and still seething, the police opened fire on an innocuous protest near the bridge. Some thought of it as Sarvez Shokat's cousin. A few months later, in March 1990, Shokat's older brother Sajjad quietly slipped away from the house. Only 16 at the time, Sajjad had joined the newly emerged Students Liberation Front and like thousands of other young men in Kashmir who went looking for training in handling arms, he crossed over the line of control to Pakistan-controlled Kashmir. Sayyid Shahriyar is the eighth uh, very young uh, a photojournalist. This image from 2016 from the funeral of Burhan Wani, which as you know, it was a, he was a very kind of um, charismatic, iconic, young militant commander who was killed in, in August and his killing led to the Kashmir Valley being totally paralyzed for, for four months and um, uh, yeah, um, this image uh, which was him used very elegantly in the poster that he had made uh, of a police car making an announcement, uh, in a sense it's quite an innocuous uh, announcement because there's a rumor of that polio vaccine had been poisoned, <laughs> so uh, they were going around trying to say, well, you know, it's not poisoned. <laughs> and um, um, Sayyid Sharia also is a, is a Shia uh, and uh, the Shias are a tiny minority in what's largely a, a Sunni uh, Muslim population and is very diligent about documenting uh, the Shia part of Kashmir life, so has done this uh, very, very, um, I think, quite profound set of pictures of Muharram uh, 
in places and situations that other people don't even think of, of, of entering. Till a few years ago, we tried to position ourselves on the side of the protesters. It gave us a very different perspective on their battles with the paramilitary. But that changed completely after 2013. It's become too dangerous for the photographers. Pellet guns are everything for the police now. I don't understand it. They seem to love these pellet guns. It's like a narcotic for them. Sometimes at a protest, they shoot people in the leg, even when the stone throwing is not too heavy, just so that they can identify them later, a sort of tag. And they're bringing up, at the end of the book, uh, Azan Shah, <coughs> who I can only describe as absurdly young. He's <laughs> not even 20. Um, and uh, very unusual, sees himself as a photographer of the street. Um, barely made it through school. I think his parents had to push him through eight different schools to just get him to pass. Um, and uh, a very solitary uh, figure, um, but very precocious, and makes a kind of image that uh, really gets everybody thinking. Uh, never shoots in the busy, crowded, uh, you know, chaotic, violent situations. Always chooses to shoot early morning or on Hartar days or on Sundays. Um, Fascinated by the effect that shadows have. Um, and when he does step out on a day when there's something going on, when you can make out what it is that takes his eye and where he decides to situate himself, you have to accept what is around you and then try to make pictures. That's what I try to do. But you have to start in the morning because things get messy <laughs> in the day. <laughs> Would I like to be invisible? Well, I've been taking a lot of pictures on my smartphone recently. It's made me realize the beauty of imperfection in photography. Sharpness is overrated. And I don't like photos that are too sharp or too perfect in terms of dynamic range. Nor do I like photos that are cropped perfectly. Real life and the streets are not perfect. It's the imperfect edges of a photograph that give it realness. So that's it. Nine photographers, 86, 2016. We're very lucky uh, to have you here, and uh, I think it's the first uh, event on Kashmir, uh, certainly since Gravani's uh, uh, episode. So, and I quite like the kind of long range uh, uh, that we had here. And of course, uh, those of us uh, who are familiar with your work will know that you've been a very important witness to uh, lots of uh, different political movements in India. So actually I have a number of things that I wanted to draw you out on, uh, if I may, but really the first thing being the question of witnessing itself as a form of politics, uh, you know, rather than simply a form of reportage or recording. And uh, given, uh, as it were, especially uh, the mammoth state power on one side uh, and the very quotidian everyday form of witnessing that these photographs are doing, both as photographers themselves, but also uh, people that they're representing in them. So I was wondering if you could say something yes. uh, about uh, witnessing, but also, uh, uh, you know, uh, thinking about witnessing with your other work, uh, how does the Kashmir story pan out with the other forms of witnessing going on with uh, Malazam, the other things that you've done in uh, with India. So, um, specifically, in, in this context, there was a kind of, uh, what should I say, uh, you can call it either a linguistic or a cultural detail, mm -hmm. which is that the word uh, and the Kashmiri American poet Aga Shahid Ali mm -hmm. wrote about it. Mm -hmm. You know, the the kind of ambiguity in the, in the word Shahid Shahid, which mm -hmm. is the witness and the martyr mm -hmm. in both in Arabic and Urdu, the, the word is the same, you know. So, while we use the word witness on the cover, we do use the word Shaheed inside the book. And I think it's not simply that that is the way in which those who read Urdu and Arabic encounter it. But I think in the context of Kashmir, 
somehow it has been very important for Kashmiris um, to also, you know, gawahi dena, you know, to, to right. actually give evidence Stand of what's happening. Yeah. So, in the protest, for example, uh, the slogans are mm, almost never in Kashmir. Yeah. It's go India, go back, or hum kya chahte azadi in Urdu, you know, because you're not speaking to yourself, you're speaking to the outside world. The placards are almost always in English, you know. Uh, and in that sense, and in the sense of the ambiguity of the word that I was talking about, a child who's run over by a military truck is also a shaheed, you know, he's also a martyr. Because by his death, by his or her death, you know, you are, you are a martyr, you know. And even the very act of witnessing, and I mean, I don't want to, um, I, don't, I don't want to, uh, sort of, uh, how should I say, uh, implicate myself very, uh, more deeply than is necessary. But it is a fact that if you spend a year and a half working on a film in the Narmada Valley about the anti-dam movement, in a sense, you are martyred to to it. You know, you're not you're not likely to say yes on the one hand this, but you know on the other hand there is that. You know, uh, and I think that the work that one has been doing over the last 10, 15 years, uh, which is now read as more explicitly political work is characterized by a lack of balance, which I'm completely comfortable with. And one of the things that I'm um, very uh, sort of, I'm very happy to share with younger audiences in India is that, no, there aren't two sides to everything, you know, <laughs> which is a very difficult proposition, you know, that uh, sometimes, you know, there's only one side. So uh, in that sense, uh, you know, uh, going to Kashmir and making a 2 hour and 19 minute film, the challenge was uh, for it to be a pretty one-sided film, but to be highly persuasive. You know, how do I create something where the form of it is such that you can't, you can't dismiss me? Yeah. That is the challenge. So uh, that is what something like this is trying to do, you know, draw you in. There is no doubt from the beginning to the end what this book is about, where it stands. It's not an, It's not going to say, well, you know, there is this, but there is that. No. But how do I make it impossible for you to swallow it and say, yeah, 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 I know, you know, it's much more complicated. Life is not so simple, you know, <laughs> to make that impossible. Yeah. So this is the thing. I mean, I was thinking more about, again, to put the politics of anti-statism, which is a very long tradition in India, uh, going all the way with the Gadar movement in the early 1910s uh, to, say, the Sikh militancy that I grew up with in, 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 in Punjab, uh, but also Mao's uh, Ramadan Prachal. How do you sort of place the Kashmir story with that? Place? That was really, so one thing is about witnessing, but there are other forms of it, or is there a kind of another sort of and draw you out. Yeah. Do you want to connect your other work with this work? So, uh, I do see myself principally as a documentary filmmaker, mm -hmm. and I think that uh, I insist that we may not make the best documentaries in the world, but we certainly have a very rich and engaged tradition in India. Mm -hmm. You know, and I've seen it grow as I have grown. And uh, if I were to uh, to sort of put a marker somewhere then I would say that the emergency, yes. uh, you know, for those of you who don't know when the period when Mrs. Indira Gandhi promulgated a kind of emergency, suspended civil rights laws, and uh, it was a 19-month interim. By the standards of what happens and uh, what the Indian state now does, is no big deal. But it was a very, very significant watershed. And I think that the Indian documentary, like public life in general, I think that the, um, if we can use the word, uh, you know, like the, the intellectual class of which in India we have great belief in, the Buddhi Jeevi, I think that the project of nation building had absorbed the intellectual class completely from 47 till 75. You know, everybody was busy building the nation. If you were a newspaper editor or you were a reporter, you were all trying to make this nation. You were never asking questions of it. 
And I think that the rupture of the emergency actually is a very, very significant point. And, uh, you know, some of you have seen the work of Anand Patwardhan. He's not the first Indian documentary filmmaker, but he was the first Indian documentary filmmaker to cross that line, you know, and take an anti-state position, which was not a tradition that we had. You know, there have been brilliant documentary filmmakers like Subhay who made films earlier. But if you look at their work now, it's like, you know, they want to cover up. They don't want to challenge. They want to say things are terrible, but you know, we can, if the government just sorted itself out, it could be better, you know, that kind of thing. So I think that, uh, I think that if there is a, a critical tradition, uh, and I, I can only speak of the documentary film because I think in the media it had a shorter life. Mm -hmm. I think the media, because of the amount of money they poured in, uh, kind of got absorbed into a different narrative. I'm talking about the print media, television completely. Uh, but I think that the documentary the film, because of its autonomy, uh, managed to retain that, that critical edge. Kashmir, however, remains an aberration. Kashmir is the big silence in Indian public life. Uh, we were speaking earlier this evening about it, that things have begun to change over the last 10 years. But if you were to ask me, uh, I visited Kashmir in 1989, uh, which was just when things had begun to turn bad. And then I visited in 2003. So I didn't go for 14 years and actually I don't even have a good reason why I didn't go. Like, I suppose I behaved like an Indian, you know, I just blanked it out. And I had friends who would come and say, that, you know, don't you think you should make a film in Kashmir? And I'd say, yeah, yeah, you know, I will and you know, whatever. And it was only in 2003 that I went that, um, and I'm, I say this very often, that I think that uh, that trip was the, the one phrase that I think most accurately describes that experience was that I was very humiliated. I was humiliated at how little I knew. Uh, you know, I thought I was a pretty smart guy. I live in New Delhi. I read several newspapers. I look at television. But nothing prepared me for what I saw. Um, and I think that uh, there was a prehistory to it, uh, which complicated matters for me. I had been involved in the defense uh, of uh, Delhi University uh, teacher of Arabic, uh, Sayyid uh, uh, Abdul Rahman Gilani, who was implicated in the parliament attack. And I was called in to um, translate a 2 minute and 16 second phone wiretap, uh, which was the only evidence against him. And I walked into it pretty innocently, uh, but it gave me a ringside view of how Kashmiris were thought of and treated by the justice system in India. Uh, and it exposed the incredible prejudice. Just to give you an example, uh, and this is not unconnected to what we're talking about. You know, when the, the lawyers, his defense lawyers came to me, I said, but why me? I mean, you know, my Kashmiri is not that great. They said, no, but we don't want a Muslim. So I said, all right, then there must be, there are professors who are Kashmiri Pandits, you know, eminent people, scholars of language. And they said, we've asked all of them and they're not willing to do it. So I think that I was, when I went in 2003, I was in a bit of a rage about this silence, you know. And um, I think that between then and now, lots has changed. I think that it's a huge achievement of the Kashmiris themselves. No one gave it to them. Young Kashmiris have written, they have taken photographs, they have blogged, till they have made themselves heard. You know, they get beaten up, they get into all kinds of situations, but they have done the impossible, that they have taken the enormous weighty silence of the Indian middle class and poked a fine needle into it. Till today, now, you can talk about Kashmir. I was telling Shruti this, we had a release event for this book in Delhi uh, on the 15th of February. And we had it in an open air amphitheater in the heart of New Delhi. And we had maybe 250 people there. And there was no trouble. And all of us looked at each other in the end and said, this is the first event we've been to where there hasn't been a fracas. Because you can't do anything to do with Kashmir when there's no fracas. You know, where there's no somebody comes and starts threatening to pull the whole thing down and so on and so forth. So, I think that in that sense, a book like this is also a celebration of that ability to keep alive 
a, a voice. Sorry, I don't even know if I'll answer no, your question. No, that's all right. I mean, I just, uh, finally, how do you think there are kind of two registers that one sort of saw, which sort of ran through, uh, you know, the spectrum of photographers, uh, which was really uh, the very ordinary life. Uh, I was particularly struck by the, uh, the photographs of the last, the youngest chap. Yes. And they're most, you know, how do I put it, sort of the most stylized yes. in his in, yeah. in his picture images. But you have, in, you know, you have, as it were, glimpses of that in other, the other photographers. And then there's the other kind of photojournalistic image yeah. that we are used to, of you know the, the extreme violence, you know, the extremists of, of violence yes. that is being recorded. Um, I wanted to sort of ask you, you know, uh, in a way. Um, a very crass level, <laughs> which do you think is more effective? <laughs> uh, you know, because there's a way in which uh, we're kind of, you don't have to see an image of violence to know what it looks like. But it's very, very hard to come by uh, an image of the ordinary, you know. Uh, and I thought the image of the woman with her pink smartphone, yes. and uh, you know, it's going to stay. There's yeah. something very evocative of that. About so, that. so, you know, should we, as a documentary <laughs> filmmaker, one is very very sensitive to the uh, the issue of context mm. that uh, an image has meaning only in a certain context mm. you know so for example if this was a book only with the work of people like azan shah i'm not sure that the work of azan shah would carry the valency that it has now you know so in a sense you need that in order for this to you know you, you know, so in that sense it's um, it has to do with age the older guys are still outraged by what they see, you know, like they, they, they belong to a generation which grew up before all this happened. The younger guys, you know, they're in their 20s, this is what they know, you know. And so it's not, it's not so full of meaning for them, they've seen through it, you know. They're now trying to look beyond. So someone like Sayyid Charya, like I said to you before, he... Uh, is not always going to the noisiest, most sort of, you know, uh, exciting place. He's actually going behind. In the in the floods of 2014, when everybody is shooting in downtown Srinagar and watching, shooting the rescue and getting into helicopters, he goes to the backwaters of the Dal Lake and shoots there what's happening, what's happening to life and, and creates a luminous series of portraits of what, how people cope with the flooding. So, uh, in that sense, I think... Uh, Precisely because they are different registers, I think that it's, you know, that's how meaning also comes yes. through. I think that if it, if it had only one register, then it wouldn't have the power of the other, you know. Uh, I know that it happens works in a film, that sometimes a long, leisurely kind of preamble and you enter and then you can change the space. But if you were to keep that pace from the beginning, it wouldn't have meaning because you need to, you need to enter the space and understand what's going on. Sanjay, for a wonderful set of comments. I, I suppose I have a few questions, but I'll, I'll restrict myself just to a couple. The first was that I took one very, very important part of this project to be endeavouring the construction of some kind of public memory, or right? yes. contribution to the construction of public memory. I, I, I read it in a way, a Zelda piece with, do you remember, kind of Poshpura, yes. for example, a collective project attempting to keep the memory alive and the narratives alive of victims of a mass rape conducted by the Indian Army in the early 90s. And of course, in the construction of public memory and witness, we have a sort of common space where the photographers are witnesses. They're also participants in the construction of memory. They're also citizens or would-be citizens of some Kashmiri polity or, or nation or people. And I suppose when I was thinking of Shruti's question about anti-statism, I was thinking, well, if we think of the modes of resistance of Kashmiris in the Indian state, it's anti-state, but it's pro some collective subject. It's pro some idea of the Kashmiri nation. And of course, that comes with a whole baggage of potential exclusions, the attempt to create a sovereign, single voice. In Kashmir, it's always been dogged and haunted by the plight of the Kashmiri pundits, first of all. In another sense, I, I understand why this there are multiple reasons why this might have been the case, but all the photographers, for example, are male in this volume. So I suppose I wondered to what extent these photographers, young and old, saw themselves as participating in some project in constructing the Kashmiri nation, and how 
they negotiated this inclusion and exclusion dynamic. So there are at least three different questions that uh, in, in my current state of mind, having finished this book, I, you need to, might need to help me to remember the. So uh, the first question about this collective memory, um, I think what is really significant is not that these people necessarily see themselves as repositories of memory. What makes it in the Kashmir context, what makes it very interesting is that the people make it significant. You know, I, I sort of Right at the beginning, there was that very stately image of a crackdown in downtown Srinagar with a family sitting there and these soldiers with weapons around them. So I did a, uh, uh, I was chatting to Mirajideen one day and he said to me, he said, you know, I can take you to this house. So I said, all right, let's go. So I made a couple of large prints and then we drove down. I've written about it in the book. And we drove down to Ali Kadal, which is where the picture he thought he had taken. And it's, it was quite a ride because, you know, we had to ask around and eventually we landed up at that house. And it was the same, very, very interesting, what having that one image in our hand, what it did to the pH balance of that whole area, <laughs> you know. Uh, people said, oh, I, I know that house, just come, I'll take you. And then he said, I know that picture that came out in India today. I walked to the State Library in 1992 to see the India today. And, uh, okay, so we went to the wrong house and we went to the right house. Uh, and, you know, they said, oh, we know who that is. You know, we just call him, just call. and then, you know, from the neighborhood, people started gathering, and then a young man came up to me, you know, in a sort of, what, what is this called, a hoodie, a red hoodie, and he said, um, yeah, I remember that. I said, no, you can't remember that. You, you were too young. He said, no, I was a little kid, and I remember soldiers with their boots coming into my bedroom, and my being very scared, and he was speaking in Kashmiri to me, and he said, uh, I remember the trauma. He used the word in English. You know. So, in that sense, what makes these images special, especially the older one, all of them actually, is that I don't think in any, I can't think of another context where you know people connect so directly with with this because it's it's the act of witnessing. You know, now our story has gone out. You know, once your story has gone out, you're safe. Javed Dar, uh, you know, his his. Profile ends with the story of 2016 when this little child was. Uh, well, there was a protest in Harvan, which is on the outskirts of Srinagar, it's near a forest. And the police opened fire with these pellet guns, and um, the boys ran in every which direction, and this one boy was missing. And the police claimed that, you know, we didn't do anything to him, he's running to the forest. And next day, his body was found, and the police said, yes, he's been uh, mauled by bears. But when the body was found, it was full of pellets. And uh, Javed describes how all afternoon they kept getting phone calls saying, you've got to come, you've got to take a picture because the funeral is due. And these guys just raced in there, they lifted his shirt, they took the pictures and the burial happened. Now, they could have taken the pictures themselves. It was not for forensic reasons that they wanted. So I think that in Kashmir, Without, uh, I'm not trying to theorize it because I probably can't, but uh, the business of image making actually folds right back. It's not some that, you know, 20 years from now, when they open this book, they will read meaning into it. It's like, now it's in the book. It was in the film, you know, like that. I mean, I don't want to uh, sort of, I don't want to sound boastful about it, but when I made Jashne Azadi in 20, 2007. It was not a film made for Kashmiris at all. It was meant to, pardon the expression, get up the wick of Indians. But I was just completely, from the first screening that I made in Srinagar, amazed by how Kashmiris responded. Because till 2007, there had never been a film that in any which way uh, evoked, I won't say reconstructed, can't have reconstruct, even evoked what the last 20 years had been like, you know. And it was, I think that every filmmaker has to have one screening like that when I showed it in stream, you know, because it was completely out of control, you know. 
there was slogan shouting, people were crying. It was just crazy, absolutely crazy. And the film still circulates, you know. Um, and that's not because I'm such a great filmmaker, but you know, because I had the privilege and the ability to pull it off. You know? Just like I've had the privilege and the ability to pull this off. You know? So, in that sense, the point I'm trying to make is that this is not some abstract uh, memorialization of time. This is very real, it's imitate. And I know that as soon as the book gets to Kashmir, that there will it's going to be a lot of excitement, you know, uh, in all sorts of ways. Yeah, we can leave the other two muddled questions. No, no, they are not muddled uh, at all. But uh, I do uh, have one thing to ask. So the, the can, can I answer them? Of, very of course, yes. because they're very important question. One of the questions was about the Kashmiri Pandits. Now, um, just for those who don't know the issue, uh, the Kashmiri Pandits were a tiny uh, sort of a minority population, less than 4% of the population in uh, Kashmir. My family are also Kashmiri Pandits. And um, small but very influential uh, uh, teachers, bureaucrats, so let's say inordinately influential given their size and uh, population. And one of the tragedies of the early 90s was that beginning with the assassination of Justice Nilkant Ganju, that the Kashmiri Pandits felt extremely insecure, which they were, and uncertain, and they left. And for various complicated reasons, for which this is not the right forum, uh, they never came back. So the Kashmiri Pandit migration is a major, major issue in Kashmir and much more so in India. So any time in Indian public life, if you say Kashmir, I can guarantee you that from the other side of the table you will hear Kashmiri Pandits. You know, what about them? Full, but it's, it's a kind of trope, you know, that on in February 1990, overnight, two and a half lakh Kashmiri Pandits fled the valley. It was a little bit like partition, you know, like in people's imaginations. So when I was researching this book, I said, surely there are images of the migration, you know, and there aren't. So I started asking some of the older photographers. I asked Merajuddin. I said, "So, how come you didn't, don't have pictures of the migration?" He said, uh, "I don't know. Maybe they went at night." I said, two and a half lakh people. You know, that would be a lot of nights over which they had to flee." He said, "Yeah, that's true. I don't know." And uh, so, story became a thing that I would ask all the photographers. You know, that do you know why there are no pictures? And it is very interesting because. For, you can imagine that the photographers in Kashmir were colluding to be silent about a very shameful thing. What about the photographers in the city of Jammu, to which they were all migrating? Surely some newspaper editors said, hey, go get a picture. You know, what about the news editors in Delhi? If, and the migration did happen, and I'm not for a moment saying it didn't happen, but there are no pictures, you know. And I, I wrote about this in the introduction. I put my neck on the block actually by doing that because I want somebody to prove me wrong because I know that there are no pictures. Now does that mean that the migration did not happen? No, it happened. But perhaps it happened differently. And if it happened in a different way, perhaps the way in which we read it is going to be different. For example, one of the younger photographers told me, he said, I'll tell you why there are no pictures. Because they didn't leave forever. The Kashmiri Pandits left thinking that it's just a few months. So he said, I remember my neighbors at the bus stand with two suitcases saying, yeah, yeah, we're going to Jammu for a couple of months and we'll come back in spring. And then they didn't come back. So this might seem an arcane for those who are not from India, but you cannot imagine the import of this in the, in the Indian context because this is the big, this is not only the big stick with which the movement is beaten, this is what has prevented the Indian left liberal progressive from engaging with Kashmir. Saying, how can we support you guys because you chased the Kashmiri Pandits out. You know? And this, this chased them out, they left, they fled. You know, the, the nuance is everything in this matter. So it is a very important question. And lastly about uh, uh, the absence of women photographers, a very important question. Um, well, there are no women photojournalists, and this was a question that I was asked, or we were all asked uh, in, in Delhi at the release. 
and uh, it was not very satisfactorily answered. I didn't want to answer it because you know I don't live in Kashmir, so I thought I would leave it to the photographers, and they were very clumsy and they said things like, "Yes, yes, women should take pictures of the home and art." <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> saying, "No, let me just outlive this moment." <laughs> uh, but uh, many younger Kashmiri women then started on Facebook saying, I was there, I wanted to speak up, but I felt a little embarrassed, but, um, you know, what are you talking about, you know, women going out as photojournalists in a place where rape is such a huge instrument of state policy, you know, uh, how vulnerable do you think women will be? Uh, I also started getting emails from women saying, look, we don't have a problem, yeah, yeah, we know you didn't have women in this book, but here's my work, and there's a group of us, and we're planning to do this, so actually, the fact that they're absent, has, and Shokat Nanda, who's in the book, uh, actually been, has been doing workshops with very young uh, people, and many of them are women. And now he's totally determined that this summer, he's going to do a workshop, not just with women, but that if there are 20 people, there are going to be 16 women or something like that. So it's kind of triggered something. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I think perhaps we should open the floor up for questions. Yeah. questions. So, yeah, please. Questions for any of us on the panel. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so I've always um, heard during this period about the description of them versus going into the mirror. Um, could you expand on that and a little bit of sort of what was it now? Um, what, what was it that sort of, again, here saying that they were never allowed in to make some hard numbers? So, uh, one of the things that you have to grant the Indian state is that uh, what it's really good at is uh, is to come out looking good. It can do the unspeakable and not make you know you won't even know it. You know, uh, so it's not as if. Journalists uh, have ever been. There's not been any blanket ban or nobody, you know. Uh, but if, if if I take your question, uh, with you asking me uh, about international journalists, well, I think that the deployment of the visa regime is ruthless with regard to Kashmir. So if you're a New Delhi-based correspondent and you could be the biggest fat cat, you could be working for the New York Times, but you do one story on Kashmir. It's okay. You do another one and you'll be called in. You do a third one and they might even revoke your visa. It's happened to people. It happens to photographers. You know. So eventually, I mean we were having this conversation earlier today that what about the international coverage of Kashmir? And actually, uh, and Wasim was also drawing attention to the fact that in the early 90s, between the New York Times and Time magazine, they actually provide us the only first-hand accounts of many of these massacres because, you know, a reporter happened to be in Kashmir. So, in the early 90s, the international media was interested in Kashmir. They were reporting it. And then slowly it disappears. And it's not a coincidence that from 1990 onwards, as the Indian economy liberalizes and as India becomes the glorious new destination for global capital, that you know, the editors tell their people that take it easy, you know, you should be doing more stories out of Bombay or Bangalore. What's all this Kashmir stuff? You know, who's interested? It's an old story. So, it is very tightly controlled. Um, there are sudden spikes. So, in 2016, when this pellet blinding stuff happened, I was mentioning New York Times in a front page picture, big story on pellet blinding, and then dark. So, you can be sure that for six months, no matter what happens in Kashmir, there won't be NYT page one story on Kashmir, you know, unless you know, 300 people are killed on one day or something. So it is very, very tightly controlled. And as far as the Indian media is controlled, I don't have to explain, you know, that uh, they don't even, they, their arm doesn't even have to be twisted. For the most part, um, you know, there is a human rights perspective. Oh, this is terrible. People shouldn't be blind. But never will they... Uh, on Indian television, there's a stock set of not very bright Kashmiri politicians who always make it. So that they can come on television and be humiliated and look like real idiots. You know. 
But um, I, mean, I mean, sorry to, I mean, I'm not trying to include myself. I'm not, a, I'm not a political figure. But a badge of honor for me is that in the last ten years, I've never been invited to a television. Show. <laughs> you know, I mean, it tells me something that the danger that you might actually say something on live television which needs to be said. So they can be sure that you call up, you know, certain set set of clowns who are so clumsy that they trip over their own laces and say something foolish and then they are shouted down and it's over. So, but in the same context, how does one then explain the fact that actually the issue has become very live and part of Indian public debate? So it's not something that you, you know, yes. this, is, this is absolutely new. Yes. So I think, uh, like I said earlier, I think that Kashmiris themselves have done writers, you know. Bashar Peer wrote a memoir of growing up. Mirza Wahid has written two novels set in Kashmir. Um, Kashmir has kind of, you know, circled around and entered the Indian consciousness. So I, I was telling uh, Shruti today that it's not as if Indians are ready to say Azadi or even right to self determination. But I think by and large, people are convinced that some bad shit happened. <laughs> you know, that is pretty clear. And also that it's not a Pakistan thing. You know, it uh, doesn't matter if young guys come out wearing Pakistani flags. Maybe military intelligence sent those flags. We don't know. But that it's about something else. That they really do have a, they have a grouse. Now they might disagree with that and say they don't deserve it. Or how will they survive? And China will swallow them up. Or Pakistan will swallow Whatever. Any number of excuses, you know. Uh, but it's kind of the bad marriage uh, metaphor that, oh, but don't they know that this Pakistani husband will be worse, you know, if I show you, you know, that kind of thing. That, uh. um, thank you for a really brilliant and inspiring presentation. Uh, just to follow on in terms of the interest or the vocalization around Kashmir that the Indian liberal on the left has after actually quite a long time. History. Could you speak a little bit more, because I agree with you that of course it's the work of the Kashmiris themselves, mm -hmm. but what else has been going on within Indian liberal and left circles? Is it because that under the shadow of Modi, to criticize the I don't know, I'm, I'm Pakistani, sorry, but, but is it because under the shadow of Modi, it's easier now to criticize the Indian state and it, it easily fits into a, another kind of fight and now it's more convenient? Or oh. is there a real shift? Mm -hmm. So, uh, one is that, for example, if you take the orthodox Indian left, which is the CPI, CPIM, they are still totally opaque. In 2016, it was appalling. I mean, I'm, I'm on Facebook and I know certain key figures who are affiliated with the CPM, which is the Communist Party of India Marxist, uh, relentlessly talking about Gaza, Palestine, but not a peep about Kashmir, not a peep, you know. So, in, and the, the, the CPM, uh, for various reasons, including the fact that they were in power in West Bengal for 35 years and they've been in and out of power in Kerala for 30 years, uh, has an inordinately large footprint in intellectual life in India. So, it's a party line, no matter what people think as individuals. So long as you are affiliated with the CPM, you cannot speak of Kashmir. Uh, if you cross the line to the more radical left, which for my money is the only left left now. Uh, so say the CPI ML, which uh, is not underground, or is, uh, the CPI ML, what are called the Naxalites. Now they, in theory, in a, in, in a written party document, have conceded the right of self-determination. So the CPI ML, in theory, is in favor of Azadi for Kashmir. However, in practice, they are quite strategic. I mean, I have attended marches that the CPIML calls, um, which uh, which will speak in favor of the Kashmiris, but you don't hear the word self-determination or Azadi. Although, if you corner them, they'll say, "Well, you know, in our 68 res resolution, we did." You know, so it's a little bit of brinkmanship. The only people who openly and uh, unabashedly speak other mouths. So uh, the whole fracas in the Jawaharlal Nehru University and Umar Khalid is because the, the political formation that they are part of are 
affiliated to the Maoists, and they have a very unambiguous, uh, clearly stated position. And this is the, the broad spectrum of the, of the left. But that's about the left. There's yes. also another turning point. Would you want to say something about the Musharraf Mohan Singh dialogue? Yes. Which, of course, is uh, now sort of in cold storage, where questions of soft sovereignty were open and discussed yeah. for the first time, which in a way allowed for a kind of, I don't want to use the word soft landing because there is nothing soft about the Kashmir Sea, but it allowed for a kind of um, you know, in a way, you couldn't ignore the issue any longer. And it wasn't simply about a cycle of summer's violence um, and then a response. But so, there was a kind of real uh, reckoning by very mainstream political actors that, as you would put it, some bad stuff is happening. So I'm a bit cynical about that positioning because I believe that it is, um, you know, it's a classic what in the India-Pakistan context, it's called track two and then track three and track four. Okay, you know, know yeah, which is basically not state, <laughs> but it happens in lovely places like Pattaya and you know whatever the Maldives and nice hotels and everybody has a good time. And it's supposed to keep some bridges going between Indians and Pakistanis and some token Kashmiris, you know. And out of that, you will have these delegations of well-meaning. Indian public figures who at times of crisis will fly down to Srinagar and want to meet the political figures and the political figures will refuse to see them and then they'll try to go to the hospitals and the hospitals with people will chase them out and so I think it's really the what I said earlier on that the Indian state is very good at muddling the context that every time there is clarity whether it's 2014, whether it's 2016, whether it's 2010, every time there is a crisis that makes it totally clear to everybody what the troubles are about, in will fly in the ghouls and conf try to confuse matters. But I think that stuff is running out of steam. I think that in 2016, delegations of, uh, and you know, yeah, there's, you know. A, there's a lot of money uh, in these sort of so-called NGOs which you know, busy having conferences and meetings and flying young people all over and flying them back and no one really knows what are the benchmarks by which we have to evaluate what happens. Nobody knows what the goals are. The, the language is all very kind of uh, full of feeling and we, we feel, but read the text carefully. There is no political agency. The whole thing is these poor Kashmiris, they're having such a hard time if we just treated them better, they would come and clasp us to their bosom and become part of India all over again. And that is simply finding fewer and fewer takers, especially amongst young people. Because the young people are totally clear. Uh, you know, every time something like this happens, you're, I mean, if you are just on Facebook and you have a thousand Kashmiris there, you can see how quickly people can read through it. So I think that the Indian state actually has a real crisis on it. Because uh, the old, uh, you know, the period of kind of obfuscating confusion, the internet, the public conversations that happen, the way in which the internet can infect mainstream opinion. You know, every time there's some bullshit trotted out on the mainstream channels, it doesn't even take eight hours before people tear it to bits and then slowly you find that it's been moderated. So I think that that old hegemonic control of information, of I, I really think that the net has a huge role to play in allowing Kashmiris to speak back. You know, I know of young Kashmiri writers who write an essay and they're not bothered about giving it to the Times of India or Outlook or India Today. They just don't bother. They write it, they put it on Facebook and you have to see how it flies. You know? And it's not only Kashmiris who are reading. So I think that, and which explains why every time there's trouble in Kashmir, the first thing to be killed is the internet. Every single time, you know, they cut the internet, they cut the cell phone services, they stop SMSs, they cut WhatsApp, you know, all that kind of stuff, because the people are talking back. Sorry. 
I thank you for the wonderful presentation. I was just wondering, uh, I mean, in the larger political imaginary of Kashmir, I mean, this comes out a lot in uh, the poetry and literature also. There is this very deep attachment to the homeland, but the movement in itself, as uh, it emerged during the discussion, is deeply anti-political and it is exposed to the violence of the nation state. So I was wondering if you wanted to comment a bit on that. You know, how do they imagine the home and this you know, idea that comes through in a lot of the poetry here, even the public protests? It's a very complicated thing. And sometimes that is a charge which is leveled, which is to say, so what do you mean? My what is Azami? Uh, and it can get, like last evening in, I, I did an event in uh, at Westminster, and there's somebody in the audience who I, I've known for some time, he is from the Mirpur side, you know, the Azad Kashmir. And I remember when I first met him in 2007 in, in, in Leeds, um, we were at dinner and he said, you know, we are the real Kashmiri nationalists because we don't even speak Kashmiri. And yet we believe in Kashmir. We speak Pahari, we speak Potohari. You know? And there is, a, there is something, and now this might sound like Mambo Jambo to you, but there is something um, there's something beyond a crude sense of nationality which makes it, you know, be what being a Kashmiri is. I think that, if you allow me a small digression, um, I have always felt that, you know, most Indians, for example, their imagination of Kashmir is like a, like a hat on top of India and that's not the way it is. It's actually a hat, but it faces the other way. You know, the, the, the tall passes are towards the, the Peer Panjal. The natural flows of Kashmir are to the, you know, to the west and to the north. The, our rivers flow that way. My grandfather went to college in Rawalpindi. You know, Mirpur was the biggest town from Srinagar, not Jammu. Jammu was post-1947. You know. So, Kashmir is situated, you know, it's not just that it's beautiful. It has, and this is the mumbo jumbo that I want your forgiveness for. It is a blessed place, and it's blessed because it sits at the tri junction of three enormous, for want of a better word, civilizational impulses. You know, uh, the Silk Route is just there. I mean, Kazakhstan is closer to Srinagar than Delhi is. You know, um, in in my home. A very beautiful woman was always called a Kazakh tir. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it meant until much later that, you know, like a Kazakh fairy, you know. Um, if you travel to rural Kashmir, uh, you will see faces that are dazzling because they come from everywhere. You know, they come from, from the east, they come from the west. So, what if we were to reimagine Kashmir? not as a constriction, but as a, as, a, as a way of reaching out to the world. So, I, uh, I refuse to uh, answer it in entirely pragmatic ways. It's not, my, it's not my work. But I would like to think of it as a place which would actually allow all of South Asia to be a much more uh, open place. It's only our limit. I don't think of Azadi is a place with an army and a navy and an air force, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, there are examples elsewhere in the world where uh, simply, you know, Kashmiris have always been great traders and they still are. And why is that? It's because where they were uh, allowed them to be great traders, you know, that's the skill they have, you know, and they have craft and so on, that, that's, that's secondary, but they also are very, very good traders. So I think that, um, while some people must address themselves to the, to the pragmatics of it, the first problem is a problem of imagination. You know, and I know that this is not a world in which there's too much space given to having an imagination which is not small and petty and Brexit, not Brexit, border, not broader, you know, taxes, not taxes. I, I know it's, that's not, but I think it makes sense to me only when you think of it in a, in a utopian sort of way. Can I just come in on that briefly? So, one of the ways in which Kashmir has been visually represented in photography, 
not necessarily by Kashmiris themselves, is as a beautiful landscape. Yeah. And Lanya Kabir, um, an academic, has written a book about Kashmir being a territory of desire. And of course, tourism is one of the ways in which the Indian state has sought to present Kashmir as open yeah. and outward facing. Um, quite different from the sort of outward facing Azadi we would like to imagine. And a key part of this colonial gaze is the fixation on the beauty of the landscape and the beauty, supposed beauty, of the people. So, one response I noticed through this book is that, of course, one way to fight to resist that representation is to present the ugliness of violence and repression. But, of course, that can have a deeply truncating effect on the political imagination. So, I wonder if, in your conversations with these photographers, yeah. in struggling with the role as photojournalists covering the quotidian cycle of violence, what role this saw for beauty or imagination? So, uh, when I started traveling to Kashmir in 2003, and uh, I, I was telling Shruti that I have made uh, friends there who are some of my closest friends today, one of the first things I realized was that many of them uh, had not been to the Mughal Gardens, which is in Sri Lanka. And I, I couldn't get this, like how could you be 26 and not have visited this completely beautiful garden in your city? And it was a political act. It was almost seen by young people as a kind of obscenity, you know, that I'm not going to go in a shikara. I'm not going to, like if I said, well, can we not spend the night on a houseboat, you know, it's like, can't do that, you know. This is that's not Kashmir. Uh, I can't go to the garden because, you know, that's like horrible, you know. So I remember it, it really shook me up, and many of them, uh, even in the texts, will say this: that yeah, yeah, yeah. There's this thing, you know, the mountain and the trees and the forest, but yeah, like you know, what we, we don't want to do that. So it is, I think, <coughs> centuries of being beaten on the head with the beauty of the land, you know, and the, um, the, the you know, the, the sort of simultaneously with it, making people irrelevant, the erasure of people, which makes not just photographers, but other people also, you know, um, uh, kind of very, very prickly about natural beauty and this, you know, uh, this whole, uh, some of you know this, Jahangir said this thing about if there is paradise on earth, it is here, it is here, here, you know. Now, nothing raises the hackles of young Kashmiris more than that. So, I had, in the introduction, I, I kind of ironically used it, you know, uh, just to, and a couple of my friends said, you can't begin with this, you know. I mean, even as irony, it was like, no, 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 no not this, you know, something else, you know. So, of course, I insisted on keeping it there. <laughs> but it's, 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 it's really, uh, it's a huge burden. Beauty is seen as a burden. Uh, and that you, I mean, Kashmiris are incredibly parochial about their landscape, their villages, their homes, and so on and so forth. But they're not going to admit to it because they want to just, you know, deny you the right to acquire that beauty, you know. I think that's, I think, quite interesting because this is the fundamental question of desire and it's sort of something unattainable, you know, rather than something that can be fixed. And yes. Rather than this kind of metaphor of paradise, I think that the idea of it being un un unclaimed, yes. I think that's very powerful in the history of Kashmir itself, um, predating 47. Absolutely. Uh, I, and I think that's something to hold on to, actually. It, it makes it more... Uh, I think you're more open to thinking about it and more creative. You know, I did because... some digging around in archival photography. I thought at least for the introduction, let me find some images from before 1947. You know? And the Alkazi Foundation has quite mm -hmm. a fine collection of colonial uh, photography from Kashmir. And it's unbelievable. There are no people. <laughs> there are no people. There are little specks sometimes to balance the composition. So there's a tree on this side and there are two men here or there are five peasants in the field and you know. Uh, if there are uh, pictures, well then they are, you know, coppersmith at work uh, or, you know, basket weaver, you know. Uh, and that tradition carries um, right to 1986. So the big rupture of what happens, it's not simply that 
people come out to the street or that people take to the gun. But it's also a way of reimagining your land, you know. Sorry, there's a question about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to the end of that. I mean, it's the role of sort of contemporary cinema and popular Hindi cinema, oh, and yes. the, the the way in which uh, Kashmir and this sort of often empty, beauteous landscape of Kashmir is presented. Absolutely. And I was just wondering, do you feel? I mean, sort of to turn that into a question. Do you feel that that some of these photojournalists feel like they're kind of engaging with or pushing against that popular? Uh, image of, of Kashmir, which is there in, in public consciousness for many outside of the region. So the thing about popular uh, culture is that it works in really profoundly complex ways which we can never anticipate. So when uh, when I started traveling regularly after 2003, uh, one of the films that I had seen as part of my preparation was this awful Bollywood film called Mission Kashmir. You know? <laughs> and uh, uh, So when I went to Srinagar, one of the Brighter men I knew, I said something offhandedly about Mission Kashmir and how terrible it was, and he said, What do you mean? It's a great film. Don't you remember Hrithik Roshan, this good looking guy, two guns, <laughs> drops from the roof? That's what a militant should be like. <laughs> it's, it's your depiction of my life, you know. I, I don't care for it, you know. And so, I mean, there's also a more flagrant dishonesty to the way in which Kashmir is often filmed, in that Kashmir is often a generic hill station. Or it's sometimes Switzerland as well. <laughs> I mean, uh, Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, Poland, in the course of one stunt ride, you could run through all three, you know, without. Uh, I'm referring to a film with Amir Khan yeah. called Fizar. Uh, most of it is shot in Poland, uh, but that's all right, you know, better than computer graphics. Afraid we've kind of run up to the end of time. We have perhaps room for one more question. So can I, um, uh, you know, do a little bit of a sales pitch? The book is available here. Not too many copies. I have, I think, five copies. One is already sold. Um, it's available for forty pounds, which is not a small sum of money. But uh, if you like, there are cards, and you can also order it online, and then it'll be shipped to you from from India. Um, I just want to take a word to tell you that the book is self-published um, uh, and I, I wanted to talk about this because it's part of what speaking about Kashmir is about. Uh, it's, um, it's not that, I, there is no publisher who would have gone along with a 400 page book with 200 pages of the kind of images that you've seen, you know. so. Uh, I, I mean, it, we, we gave, gave the imprint a name, which is Yarbal, which in Kashmiri means uh, the, the heart of the river, you know, which is a place where you gather to bathe, to wash your dishes, and it's a place of conviviality and gossip and uh, camaraderie and flirtation, and it has all kinds of connotations. But in Hindustani, uh, Yarbal also simply means the strength of friends, and really uh, the book has been put together uh, in a pretty extraordinary way, not just by the photographers uh, and they're allowing me access to work, but the designers were not even Kashmiris, but who just simply understood what they were doing and uh, spent, gave eight months of their time for what can't even be peanuts, you know. Uh, the only deal with the designers was uh, that uh, I shouldn't tell anybody what I was paying them because it would ruin their reputation. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, it's not simply because the book is here and you can buy it, but that I think that uh, I, I choose to always talk about it because I think that uh, the possibilities of alternative modes of production, of distribution are really opening out for us and that the, really the, 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 the kind of the closeness of how the publishing industry works and all that need not be the kind of stranglehold that, and I've done this with films, and I think the only reason why one had the, the sort of courage to do it was because you had that experience, you know, so you know that yes, you will be able to kind of pull it off. And um, of course, we had support from the Prince Klaus Fund in the Netherlands as well as the India Foundation for the Arts, but that was small. I mean, obviously, it doesn't cover. So, uh, those of you who want to just carry away a card, and if anybody you know wants to order a copy of the book, we'd be interested.
you like it, we have a pretty organized online uh, selling uh, mechanism. So sorry for the sales pitch, but I'm an inveterate seller of uh, materials I produce. That's the way we survive, so it's important. Thank you, Sanjay. I think all that remains for us to do is to thank Sanjay for speaking such a wonderful talk and Shruti for joining us for a wonderful discussion. Thank, thank you very much for coming. Thank you.